Hi, I'm Harry Forbes from ARC Advisory Group. I'm here in Houston today with folks from ExxonMobil and Phoenix Contact. And we're going to be having a discussion about open process automation and the Open Process Automation Foundation and on PLC Next, which is a new control product, very open-minded, if you will, that Phoenix Contact is now introducing into the United States. With me are some experts in this area. To my right is Don Bartusiak. He is the chief engineer of process control for ExxonMobil Downstream and Chemical. And Don and his team were really the genesis of open process automation. To Don's right is David DeBerry. David DeBerry is an advanced engineering associate with ExxonMobil. And David was managing both the proof of concept and the, and the uh, later work that ExxonMobil did in developing their open process automation strategy. To my left is Jack Nellig. Jack is president of Phoenix Contact for the United States or North America mm -hmm. and uh, has been involved in the PLC Next work for some time. And finally, Ira Sharp. Ira is uh, director of product marketing for automation for Phoenix Contact and Ira is managing the rollout of this new product for Phoenix Contact. The connection between these two is that ExxonMobil, as we will learn, is, is working with PLC Next as part of their next phase of their automation journey. So Don, maybe we could start just by telling people briefly what open process automation is and what you're trying to do with that. Okay. Well, open process automation refers to uh, a standards-based, open, secure, and interoperable process automation architecture. Um, the, the second uh, basically definition that we, I want to get out there is uh, the open process automation uh, forum of the open group is the organization that's defining the standards that are the basis for the, the open process automation uh, architecture. So they're, they're the two concepts. And so what, what we're trying to do with this initiative is really to solve a, a real a root cause business problem that we have with con the control systems that we use. Um, and and I, we can get into more of the details, but that's basically the, mo the motivation for starting this initiative. Okay, and what, what, what prompted ExxonMobil to, to change direction that way? You've always, you've always had a pretty standard approach to automation and process automation. Right, well, but what we found, um, so the business problem that motivated this is, is a need for us to change a, you know, a significant percentage of our process control systems in, in downstream and chemicals. So that was the motivating business problem. And uh, the, the way that the research team was tasked to solve that problem is it was to, to, look, to look very fundamentally and to figure out what the root causes of the business problem were. And, and, and that basically got us into a, a state where like, you know, Einstein's adage, which says, you know, the definition of insanity is if you keep doing the same thing over and over again, why do you think you're going to get different results? And th that, uh, you know, succinctly is probably what motivated us to make a fairly big step change away from how we traditionally approach system replacement challenges. Okay, and you did a, you did a, initially when you articulated this vision, you, you then started doing some actual work to, to drive this. And, and it began with a, with a proof of concept? Well, it began with literature, but right. I, I would a plan. say, yeah. So the the genesis. I mean, where I mean, where we really uh, coalesced on like a critical mass of ideas that gave us clarity um, was in in 2014. Uh, I mean, I commissioned our R and D team. Uh, I call it a skunk works to help help folk understand what we actually did. Uh, I assembled about a half a dozen ExxonMobil engineers, our very imaginative guys. Dave was on that team. This team was led by Steve Batar. We brought in a couple of uh, outside industry experts. And I tasked them, guys, don't get to the bottom of the root cause of the problems and then use that basis to, to articulate what it is that we wanted. And so that produced a, a, a set of three uh, documents that really gave us a solid foundation of understanding what we wanted to do. Um, and then a part of that Skunk Works activity uh, was to look 
outside of our industry uh, for ideas for potential solutions. And we saw that uh, other adjacent industries that had similar functional requirements in terms of you know, safety criticality, high availability, real-time determinism, had solved the problem using you know, modular interoperable systems concepts mm -hmm. that really gave us the insights on what we really wanted to do. And that, that's kind of, and, th and then, th then we got into prototyping and, and this, the forum and stuff like that. But that was the, the sequence of how the idea really got rolling. And Dave, we, you know, David was we, part of that team. We evaluated all the possible solution cases for the, the problems that, that we were trying to address. Mm -hmm. Obviously, obsolescence was the sort of the, the generating force, but we realized there was a much bigger business problem, and, and we realized that the system needed to deal with cybersecurity, and we came with some other attributes, and we've, we've named them, and they come up very often in the forum work, the interoperability, interchangeability, and portability, because those are the mechanisms that would allow us to be, advance our business and make ExxonMobil more competitive. And what we realized at the end of all this evaluation of what our possible solutions were, that an open standards-based world was really the only thing that was going to solve this. And, and that's sort of how we got to the, I guess, the OPA vision. Okay. But as you, as you did that from the documents, ExxonMobil uh, funded some work right. internally um, for creating a proof of concept. And Dave, you were on that. Exactly. You were on that task force. Can you tell us a little bit about well, just so how that went? We started with the, the forum, of course, to get the, the marketplace forces working. But we realized that we had to go prove some things to ourselves. So we started with uh, evaluating the technologies that were available. Uh, we progressed to a point where we've done a proof of concept. And the proof of concept was just to answer the question, can we do this? Can we be successful using open standards, building a system that's um, open to all the capabilities that are available in, in the technology space without inventing anything new, actually. We just sort of borrowed it from other places. And then as we progressed, we took the, the proof of concept to, from a simple system, very basic, to a we included 10 different vendors. We made them all work together. We ran a, a simulation of a fired heater, which is a very common device in our world, and people could understand it. And we proved that these ideas of interoperability and interchangeability and portability actually had benefit and could generate value for the company. Um, once we did that, we moved on to our prototype activity, which we are at near the end of at this point, mm -hmm. where we are actually going, we've built a system We've accomplished a factory acceptance test level on it. We are moving it to the pilot unit in one of our facilities, and we hope to start it up very soon. And this is all about proving you can build a system using open standards. We can accomplish the business objectives of running our process and also allow for all the benefit mechanisms we feel should be available to us as end users of these systems. Okay, but ExxonMobil has had uh, informing this uh, open process automation forum or being the genesis of it, uh, work toward getting other companies involved in it. Uh, maybe you could comment on what the status of that is and who's, who's formally involved and committed to doing this besides ExxonMobil. Sure, but, but before I do that, Harry, if I may, I just want to uh, elaborate on Dave's story a little bit with a key point is uh, during that period when we were looking outside of our industry into adjacent industries, that's, that's where we discovered what others had successfully done, which is really what put rate, uh, Lockheed Martin on our radar screen as a, a very capable systems integrator who fully understood what could be done with st standards-based modular uh, open and inter interoperable systems. That was a, that was a key finding, um, and I want to make the connection of that to uh, other companies that we have chosen to work with like Phoenix Contact. So companies that are, again, capable uh, in, in what they do and basically buy into the vision. That's, that's been a key characteristic of who we've chosen to work with along the journey. Okay, so let me come back to the, what companies are now uh, involved in this initiative. 
So the, the, the best way to describe that is the, the Open Process Automation Forum, the industry standards activity. So the kickoff of that, of the forum, was in November of 2016. Um, and at present, so we started with, you know, basically nothing at the kickoff. Uh, now we have 91 organizational members of the Open Process Automation Forum. Um, it consists of 20 operating companies uh, in the following industry verticals. It's oil and gas, chemicals, pulp and paper, pharmaceuticals, and industrial gases. Um, there, And uh, we have uh, six of the seven uh, you know, global major DCS suppliers, uh, members of the forum, um, and then a host of hardware and software suppliers, again, Phoenix Contact being uh, uh, one of the members, uh, several systems integrators. Uh, your company, ARC Forum, is, is a member, that, which gives you a, an inside look at what's going on. Um, and uh, we're starting to get some interest from academics as well. So that, that reflects the, the membership of the forum. Jack Nelly, do you want to give us just a little perspective on, on your involvement in, in terms of Phoenix Contact, uh, and your perspective on this organization as it's sure. kind of in a third or fourth year? Sure. So um, th this kind of came along in parallel, I think you would say, right? So as these gentlemen have said, we've been a participant in industry for many, many years. You know, Phoenix Contact typically was known as a terminal block power supply component manufacturer that supported this industry from a automation infrastructure point of view, parts and pieces. And um, all along the way, for many, many years, we thought of all these connectivity points that needed to be managed and grown. And we, uh, we came out with IO systems and, you know, which then grew into some controllers, but not mainly in the process industry, mainly in the discrete environments, in small machine builder type environments. So, all of that kept growing and growing. Um, we were in the process industry on the component level, but we had some control system things over in the discrete world. But as we saw ExxonMobil's visions and we saw other technological forces bringing open control to the market, we then had to evolve our own visions of what we brought to the market. So in parallel to what they were doing, but not together, um, we conceived of an open control device. This is this PLC Next conversation that we're having today. And it, it allows the, the technological advantage of openness to become a choice then for our customers. So we were coming along doing that. Our friends at ExxonMobil sort of noticed that in the in the development of their vision and we got together and discussed it and it just seemed like what we were doing fit their model and um, at their request we supported them with various pieces and parts that would make it work and our PLC Next device seemed like a, a natural type controller that they were looking for. Of course they're going to in their architecture have many different choices for control but it helped them, I think, in their pilot production and their prototyping phases. So it was sort of just more of a natural evolution of how we got together in this, this thing. We were doing it sort of separately, they were doing it separately, and then I think our PLC Next device sort of brought us together as a possible cooperation. Okay. Um, one thing that we certainly hear in ARC a lot from end users is the pain point of cybersecurity. And cybersecurity as a, as a major concern for suppliers as well, um, with state actors coming in and, and threatening critical infrastructure. This is not your father's internet anymore. So can you talk about how cybersecurity is handled in this kind of open environment? I mean, certainly the way it's handled in the traditional automation environment is problematic as well, but w so, what, so one what, of the foundation concepts is with cybersecurity specifically, is it needs to be built in from the very foundation of the devices and the software. Uh, a lot of the things that we're using today were pretty much designed and invented in an era where connectivity was uh, wished for, not everywhere like today. And so the, the risks and the challenges we had in those days don't measure up today. And so what we realized is we really have to rethink 
how security of the devices and the software is baked in from the very beginning at the chip level, at the software level. Now we know there's a lot of activities uh, in industry and in, in the world about uh, cybersecurity and protection. We, we have the NIST framework, we have the IEC standards, and, and we really feel that the kind of devices we're going to have to use have to incorporate those from the very beginning all the way through. They have to be adaptable and upgradable as the technologies change and as the risks change. And, and that is the piece that we can't think of it as an afterthought where we bolt it on or layer it in or add some other piece of software um, that's not connected and, and integrated with, with that. And the standards are actually leading us to a world that's going to allow us to do it in a common way. And, and again, the, the power of the, the open standards. The, I would say that cybersecurity is, is such a huge risk in, in companies these days and the suppliers got to be you know the first or second item in their mind when they're thinking about their products that we have to sort of go back and that's one of the things we saw with the you know the companies that have adopted an open uh, mentality to their product lines they have the ability to do this versus let's upgrade something we invented 50 years ago well, let me give you two specific examples. So in, in version one of the uh, OPAS, with Open Process Automation Standard, we use the acronym OPAS. So we'll, you know, Dave and I will probably use that as in, in our dialogue this morning. But, but in version one of the OPAS standard, uh, two specific examples regarding cybersecurity. So uh, part two uh, of the standard, it basically invokes I, uh, IEC 62443. Um, and in part four, that's the, that's the basic cybersecurity part. Part four is the connectivity framework, the networking, um, and OPCUA is the centerpiece of that. So uh, in addition to citing those technical standards, um, so, and, and there's specific procedures in IEC 62443 that are called out in the standard. With OPCUA, we're making uh, extensive use of the authentic message authentication procedures that are built into OPCUA for cybersecurity. But going beyond just the technical citation in the standard, we're also working on conformance certification processes. So we have a, an arrangement now with the ISA Secure Organization basically to provide, we're still evolving the, the conformance certification process, Harry, but what we have, the deal we have in place right now is basically the ISA Secure Organization will, will give a certificate for component pro, OPAS conformant products that are presented for conformance certification. Similarly with the OPC Foundation, there will be conformance certification procedures, that, some of which will involve effective use of the cybersecurity mechanisms in OPCUA. This is an amazing topic too on cybersecurity. 20 years ago, if we were sitting around this table, we weren't talking much about cybersecurity. But today, I don't think you can buy an industrial device and stick it in their refineries or you know, midstream or upstream that doesn't have an ethernet port on it. So everything's getting sold with an ethernet port. And by that simple fact, it can be put on a, on a network and then by that simple fact, it can be hacked in some way. I'll, I'll never forget running around 15 years ago trying to sell industrial wireless devices into this industry mm -hmm. when we pioneered the first 900 megahertz, you know, point-to-point -point radio. And the beautiful of that was it was frequency hopping spread spectrum and it was unhackable. So, but that started the conversation on cybersecurity in anybody's industrial environment. And then, of course, we all shifted to Ethernet standards for communication and data networking. And now, all of a sudden, it's a massive, massive conversation um, that really needs to be addressed not only in open systems, but closed systems, doesn't matter what system. It is a very pervasive, but when you, when you pull the pin on open, it better be core to your strategy, and these gentlemen are, are definitely addressing that in the work that they're doing. And that, and that is really the issue we felt that the, the new model for open process automation would allow us to solve it in a much easier way than the traditional, the, the legacy equipment that we've had. Yeah. Um, I do know in our proof of concept and prototype activities, we have been looking at and attempting to test out the various methods of cybersecurity protections and, and the various layers way beyond what the, the vendors are offering today, really to see if we can implement, I'll call them IT quality 
cybersecurity measures within a process control system without affecting the, the reliability of the control system itself. And so we've, we really think that there's a lot to be added there and a lot to be learned from our, our IT brothers and their techniques. But cybersecurity's got to be a key piece of this. And that's really important because when we, I think when you look at that and you look at the industry and you need that IT grade network security within an application, but you also have to make sure that your system is up and it's running. And there's a different set of requirements from an OT standpoint than there is from an IT standpoint. And uh, it's paramount that that, of course, is considered, and I think that's an important part of all this as well, is making sure that it's secure, making sure that it is locked down, but not in a way that you require some sort of specialized shutdown and stopping operations in some other way. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an important bridge, and it's a, it's a challenging one. And then we as suppliers had to recognize that. I mean, it was easy for us to put a PC board in a device and make the device smart and communicatable. And we were doing that for many years. But seven or eight years ago, we saw this problem about cybersecurity. So we at Phoenix Contact purchased a small company called Anominate in Berlin, Germany, that were 20, at that time, about 20 or so uh, cybersecurity expert software engineers deploying cybersecurity for the industrial world. And now we've added that native to everything we do. And that was a very, very key step for us because we couldn't credibly look at our customers and say these products we were selling or this system we were selling was secure because we really didn't have that expertise. So we had to add it to our company and it's been a really beneficial thing for our customers because now we can sell them secure devices or we can sell them secure networking and we can stand behind it. That's great, Jack. Yeah. yeah, it's been a real challenge, but it's a, it's a really important part of the vision. Well, turning from cybersecurity, um, you folks at ExxonMobil have engaged probably a dozen or two dozen different suppliers in your proof of concept and prototype work. Phoenix Contact has certainly been one of those. Can you give us a thumbnail sketch of what you have looked look for in terms of choosing that set of suppliers? Kind of what are the things you're looking for suppliers to do? Right, so, so we, you know, as a result of that, the work that we did in 2014 to document what we want, we had a pretty good idea fun functionally what we wanted, <clears throat> so as we, you know, worked with Lockheed Martin uh, to design that, that first proof of concept that was basically done in 20, 2017. We finished it up in first quarter of 2018. And then now with the prototype that uh, we just completed the factory acceptance test uh, of two weeks ago, we were looking, there's basically two criteria, Harry. We were looking for um, components uh, of the reference architecture, products that approached what we wanted functionally. We, you know, we, we knew we aren't buying off the shelf stuff now. So we were looking for things, products that came close to what we wanted ultimately. But the second and very important criteria was will, and willingness of the supplier to work with us, mm -hmm. to integrate it. We, we knew this was first to kind stuff. We, we knew it wasn't going to work right off the shelf. We, we knew it was going to be hard but a willingness to work with us and go on this journey together. Is the, they're the two criteria that were at the root of our selection process. Okay. And, and maybe you can narrow in a little bit, uh, Dave or Don, about the, the distributed control node and give people so, some feel for so what that, that is. So that is the, the core piece that we arrived at. We have this vision that what we really wanted was a, a fairly small, um, uh, compute capable device at the edge, closer to the I.O. than our, our existing control <coughs> systems were, um, that we could task with more than one thing. It's, it's got to do more than just basic regulatory control. And so we, we coined the term DCN, um, distributed control node. And so when we started thinking about what we really, we thought of it as a small modular device, okay? And I have no problem with people thinking it's a large device that, that looks a lot like a controller today, but for us, something, you know, less than two dozen I.O., something that had more capability than just running the regulatory control, uh, something that could communicate on the network using a variety of protocols. And, and the protocols we would look for are the, the more open ones, the foundation-based type things, Ethernet-based. So the uh, industrial networks, as well as the, you know, the emerging OPC UA capability, um, 
potentially other published subscribe capabilities with the, the, the cloud being out there. Everybody wants to do um, pick your favorite set of letters, but you know, the DDS is an AMQP, um, the MQTT types of things. So we needed devices that were open to that. And, and, and as Don has said, one of the biggest pieces, nobody designed their devices to be a DCN. So we had to convince them to let us have your device and let us get into it and let's, let us modify it a little bit to see if we can make it do this DCN stuff that we've described. And they had to be willing to allow that to happen because you know, the danger is we're going to break their device or we're going to have a, a, a lot of work ahead to try and figure out how to make it work. But um, uh, You're pretty much credit, certain to break their device well, at some point uh, in time when you you're know, working on that. The yeah. of it. And, and so that is the challenge. We're in uncharted territory and we have found some very good vendors who had a uh, very clear view and, and support for our vision and allowed us to play with their devices and use their devices and helped us with using their devices and, and enabled us to be successful in our proof of concept and prototyping activities to show it is indeed possible. And going back to what Don said about Lockheed Martin, and they're so capable, somebody forgot to tell them this was impossible. <laughs> because we heard that a lot originally. The Skunk Works teams heard a lot of that's impossible, you'll never make it happen. They were able to make it happen. And, and we are indebted to them for that help and that, that service to us. You know? So that's where we're at now. It's open process automation is real and is, is possible. So that was really where we went to looking at devices. You know, we didn't want something the size of a refrigerator. We knew that we needed something with enough compute and memory and enough I.O. to do what we wanted to do. Um, so it couldn't be too small and couldn't be too big. And, and that's sort of where we got to with the DCN. And we found some very good concept devices and devices vendors have offered that fit that sort of that mold of what a, a good solid DCN could be. Yeah, let me paint the picture, uh, if I may, uh, in, in terms of what we envision with the DCN device. So, in, in essence, it's a, a combination of configurable I.O. and basic compute capability. Um, so that's, a, that's a, and, and the coupling between the I.O. and the compute capability shall be of a, uh, a, an open, a loose but cohesive way so that those, cap those functional elements are separable. That's part of the vision of you know, interchangeability, interoperability, and portability. Because one of the business problems that we do want to solve is we basically, uh, I don't want to say never want to lift the field wires, but we certainly want to enable upgrade of compute devices at a higher rate than we do the I.O. connections to field wiring. So that is a, a coupling that is hardwired in the current generation of products that we really want to break. Um, uh, and I'll, in the open process automation standard now, in part seven, uh, in version two, which we expect to publish in January of 2020, I, th I think we have a very good functional description of the DCN. And what, what it, the work that's still to be done, however, is specification of size, weight, power, connector, backplane types of physical aspects that is something that we'll tackle in ver the version three work that will take place in 2020. So that's, that's an elaboration on the DCN concept. Okay, from, from Phoenix Contact standpoint, um, you're going to be using uh, PLC Next product in the uh, prototype, prototype work, which is going to be going on in 2020. Dave, the, pro the prototype is, uh, we, we hope to have it uh, stood up, site acceptance test, uh, and, and started by the end of this year. Um, we anticipate we'll run it for a number of months. Um, it is a demonstration unit. It is not a permanent installation. It is a prototype and somewhat difficult to support long term, you know, 2015, you know, 15, 20, 30 years. Um, I don't know. Some of these things, you know, we, we did customize them. Um, moving forward, we're going to the test bed, and so we have six collaboration partners that we're going to work with on the test bed, and the idea there is we continue to use devices and, and look for other devices that can help solve this, this open question, allow for capability. Uh, we, we expect the, the vendors who have seen the, the vision will continue to work on their product and, and make improvements and adjust as necessary as they see fit. And, 
And that is really where we're headed with the, the DCN concept. Um, the, the PLC Next is very open. Our, our original view of it was we just said, wow, this is almost by description purpose made for what we want to try and see if it can work. And that's really where we're at. Certainly with, with respect to the openness for third-party software yes, and the insertion yes. of new technology yes. uh, of software, that, that, yeah. that is a bingo. You know, and, and sat, yeah. Check that yeah. box. Yeah. 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 And so yeah. what we're finding is these devices have a lot more capability than just running the regulatory control. I'll, I'll tell you that the regulatory control that is running in most of the devices we've tested it's consuming 25% of the capability. What do you do with the other 75? And those are the things that we say, this gives us that openness to add other software, other features, other capabilities. Um, and it's, it's, it's impressive that, that we're seeing vendors respond to our vision. And we're, we're, we're very thankful for that, actually. Well, PLC Next kind of came out of, of uh, Phoenix Contact over a period of years. And maybe Ira and Jack, you can talk a little bit about how PLC Next fits into this vision or really what your vision was for PLC Next and what makes it fit into both open process automation and the other kind of markets that you're targeting. Yeah, why don't I jump in with just a quick how it came about and then Ira can tell the world really what it is. So the how it came about was interesting because as we, as I said earlier, developed IO systems and then small controllers to fit in those IO systems, we, Phoenix Contact, had to live in the world of some very major players deploying a lots of very sophisticated control systems. So in a way, we had to niche ourselves into industry. And to do that, we had to deal with a lot of other people's worlds. And we did. Systematically, we made sure we were compatible with this world and then compatible with that world and compatible with that world. So we were compatible with a multiple number of defined systems ahead of us. So in a way, that was sort of open training for us. We had to kind of live in open way in a not open world. Right. So that's what drove our need for openness and our excitement when customers and end users like yourselves define openness as a need. Because we say, oh my gosh, that's the game we've been playing for all these years, but no one called it that. Right. So then with that, I'll hand it over to Ira and let him tell the world a little bit about how, what PLC Next is and how it addresses that openness in the world. Yeah, thank you, Jack. And uh, you know, when I first got involved in this whole initiative here, and in a similar way that Dave and Don, you, you looked at PLC Next and you're wondering, it's like, wow, could, how, how, how many boxes could this check in, in some of the openness aspects that you were looking for? I was on the same side of, wow, you know, we have some unique um, propositions for the PLC Next technology and the way we're going to go to market with it. And as Jack mentioned, our traditional market approach of being open and being able to be compatible with different types of systems and applications and processes. Um, it, was, it was really interesting how well the two meshed together. And when you look at PLC Next, we really define the technology, define the product, and really three core ways. It really solves three core needs in the market. And that it's a uh, Linux capable device, that's number one. Um, it's I, IoT ready is the second. And that we say it's revolutionary as the third. And when I talk about those three bullets and I think about what we've been discussing here today, the Linux piece is really the key aspect that we've really honed in on. And we saw in the market that there was this need emerging and to be open, as Jack said, to be different in the market kind of moving forward and being able to capitalize and, and utilize uh, different talents on a single platform, the Linux portion of this provides you almost unlimited capability in really whatever you'd want to do with it. Of course, we have our own way of doing things. It is a PLC, and that's the core of this. It is a real-time controller. We have our box, you can say, you know, as being a standard PLC device. But if you don't want to do that, if you want to venture into that other area, if you really want to be completely open, 
we can provide you that as well. It does this and that. And uh, we like to say that that Linux capability there is uh, following a little bit of the Spider-Man principle. You know, with great power comes great responsibility because when you venture down that road of complete Linux, you can do whatever you like, but you also have to understand where you're going, what you're doing with the software, and how you're utilizing it. But it does create a whole new ecosystem for you to use an industrialized, hardened, robust type of product that you see here in an open way to leverage whatever software you want to put on it from an open source standpoint, using different types of languages that maybe traditionally are not supported in a traditional PLC platform. And then from a revolutionary standpoint, when we say that, that's a little bit of where our traditional sandbox is and this being a standard PLC, standard real-time controller that supports IEC 61131. And it's important to understand that because this is a classic PLC and it can support your traditional programming languages like ladder diagram and structured text and function blocks and so on and so on. But it doesn't stop there because the whole idea of this product was open. So in addition to doing those things, it also supports things like C, C Sharp, MATLAB, and you can build that right in to your PLC control system. So it can be real time, um, it, it can run within an existing system of standard controls with IEC 61131, um, and it can be combined directly with the Linux side of the device. So it provides you a great bit of power. Uh, and then with the IIoT piece, we mentioned it earlier. I don't think you can have a technical conversation without bringing up IIoT at some point in time. Um, it has that capability of, as well, supporting many of the different letters that we talked about, the MQTT and so on and so on, and connects to various different cloud systems, fog systems, mist systems, whatever technology we're talking about in, in connecting to our own proprietary private cloud of ProfiCloud, uh, also things like AWS and Microsoft Azure and more. And one other thing that's really important to understand about this is we talked about security for a while here. And when you're talking about an open product, something that provides you all this capability and the high level language capability within a standard real time controller, as well as the Linux capability and providing you that almost unlimited openness, we understand that Security is extremely important. So the PLC Next control product actually complies with a recent TUV standard to make it inherently secure from a development standpoint. It's developed with security in mind so that different things like you know, back doors and these types of things are actually taken care of. Now, of course, when we're looking at the complete Linux side, you have to make sure the software aspects of that that you're putting on there are also secure but it's taking that extra step to making sure in this open world that we're protecting it as much as we can, at least at the head end, to keep it as confined as possible. You know, you, start, you kind of started talking, Ira, about the, the capabilities of the, of the box and saying with great power comes great responsibility. What I think is interesting about this from a, from a product standpoint is that you, you could kind of go the other way and say we've started with a PLC and we, we, we built a PLC and we've given you a whole tool chain to, to make small PLCs uh, applications with this. We went to what you call the, the sandbox mm -hmm. where you let other people get the development tools that they want to use and integrate those in a, in a runtime environment without doing this systems integration work mm -hmm. for a set of tools. And then you said the third thing is with, with great power comes great responsibility. You've let people open up, people like these folks over here at ExxonMobil, open up the box and, and run their own applications and their own, if you will, proof of concept. The, and the product prototype. attributes that you've just described are exactly what drew us to looking at the PLC Next product. Um, we saw the openness, we saw the possibilities, and we, we said we need to try this. And, and the fact that it is built upon um, some very solid concepts and, and some of the problems that we don't want to invent it from scratch. You've already built it. 
you just allowed it to be open for us to, to try our own thing with. And, and that's very powerful. And, and I think that's really the, when we looked at the literature, because we, I think we, we saw this in a, in a show or conference somewhere, and we, we heard about it, and we said, we've got to learn more about this. And it just, it resonated. The, the message that you just you know, gave, that's is it. This is what we, we need to try this device, which is, I think, the, the genesis of the conversation. It's like, well, let's see if these guys think like we do. And, you know, are they say an open, as a, is it marketing or is it true belief in o- what openness bring, can bring? And we got it. And, and that is, I think it's, it's amazing that it's, it's the same reasons we said, we need to look at this really hard because this looks like a good thing that we might try. You know, if I may, though, I really want to come back to the point that Jack made in the, the genesis and the evolution of the idea. So, Harry, you, you will probably remember this, you know, at, at the ARC forum events when we first floated these ideas. I certainly remember that. Tried to articulate. <laughs> Falling out of my chair. Tried to articulate the business case for, you know, the case for action and the, and the business ecosystem that we envisioned. Jack, the story that you narrated about and the realities of your world, you had to interface to all these other systems and openness solved your problems. I was saying that a couple of years ago and, you know, to, to an incredulous audience. It's really gratifying <laughs> to hear you know, uh, you know, the president of the, you know, the America's affiliate of a great company like Phoenix Contact because what we have been saying all along, the vision for open process automation is that it, it's an enabling you know, it's an enabling environment. You know, it enables innovation. You know, it, it en- enables a multiplicity of suppliers to, to find their rightful place in the ecosystem. It's really gratifying, you know, to hear the president of a company kind of tell, tell that side yeah. of the story from their perspective. And that's how we arrived at yeah. Open. Yeah. We need easy to integrate and interoperable and honest interoperability, mm-hmm. not translators or gateways and and that's amazing that you uh, i'm sure the interoperability integration issue you faced was much greater than what we faced yeah we, we but, built uh, a lot of gateways so it's interesting you you arrived at the same answer <laughs> yeah. open is the answer is to the solve answer. this problem right. it is the answer the other side of open that i like to talk about that i've learned in this whole story is the people side of it the human side of it um, we all know we have a graying workforce Uh, I'm one of them, and um, huge institutional memory inside of great companies like ExxonMobil. But you have all that graying workforce retiring, all that institutional memory leaving, and we're backfilling it with now all of these digital native kids, these kids that actually born and raised and grew up with open systems. That's what it is. So they only think open systems. So these gentlemen and we are hiring engineers out of school today. And when we try to describe closed system environments in our industrial, they they get confused. They don't get it. They don't understand why. So it actually, it's enabling innovation to come out of these humans that are entering our workforce by providing them open tools that they are familiar with, that they understand. It's, it's a really strange and important part of this vision that these gentlemen are architecting for their industry. And it's true, and it's something not in a technical spec. But I would argue it's almost as important as the technical spec of what they're trying to accomplish because we need to get these young kids today that think open, that have lived open, that are open, to come into our world and create and produce great results. And we're only going to allow them to do that if we all give them that open environment that they crave. Let me follow up on that with with a a question kind of about what your experience has been outside of the open process automation with PLC Next. Um, Because these capabilities are available for people who are doing projects. I've heard a little bit about people doing projects with it. What what has been your experience of people using these kind of levels of, of openness or levels of responsibility within yeah. the product what's what's going on there so so there's it's definitely um, an interesting time for this it really is uh, in addition to the open initiative that we're talking about here today 
you're seeing this across many different industries in many different applications. A lot of people are coming to the same conclusion. And there is a bit, a bit sometimes of, a, of an uncomfortable feel at the, uh, the high levels of, hey, things have been working really well for a long time. You know, we don't necessarily want to change it. However, when we look towards the future, we look towards the talent that's coming out of school. We look at the, 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 the digital native, as Jack described it, and what people are capable of today versus what they were 30 years ago in doing control systems. It's important to look at this and embrace it and take on these, these new opportunities because it provides a much larger pool of talent to, to take from, from, uh, from these, co these other companies. And it allows you to accomplish and, and take on tasks in a, in a different way. And in a lot of cases, even though it's different and that can be uncomfortable sometimes, in a lot of cases, it can be um, a better way, a more efficient way, a, a, a more data-driven way, which is in a lot of ways where we wanna go. And it has speed. Right? I mean, that's, that's the thing that I think you'll find you, you didn't have with traditional systems that you're, you're going to be able to, to drive with this is both speed to, to production and also agility in that right. area. And that's an important thing about PLC Next is it provides you, you know, the, the standard IEC 61131 environment. So you can do things in the standard way, but it doesn't confine you to that. It gives you the ability to do the openness aspect. So, if you want to use open source code and you want to do it directly on Linux and you want to utilize that, particularly in the, for the area of speed of, we don't have to redevelop everything. You can leverage what's already been done and has been community supported and is widely spread in many other areas. You can now do that because you can leverage these open source areas and combine it with the standard control process. And, and that's really where this is. And, and, and Jack mentioned this, so it's, there's the open initiative that's happening with, with Exxon and process. There's the PLC Next technology, which is really centered around this whole openness concept, which is kind of like the DNA for Phoenix Contact and how we've grown up. And then I think there's this people aspect that has really just started to emerge. And this is as much as a business problem solving thing as well as, a, as an open aspect, as well as a speed aspect, as a people aspect of these are the, the people that are going to be working with these control systems kind of moving forward. You, you might want to tell me a little intern texting story you know, to illuminate <laughs> the people aspect this summer. He had an intern, so it was really interesting. <laughs> so, so, so yeah, as a, as a quick yeah, tangent on that then, it, it's, a, it's a good story because we, we, did, we hired an intern and um, uh, my specialist, uh, uh, Yuri Cemarelli, hired this intern for uh, controllers. And we brought him on and, and we wanted him to do some stuff with PLC Next. And uh, as I was bringing him into the, the organization and taking him up to his desk, I was having a little chat with him. And he's a computer science intern. And I was like, oh, great, you know, so you have some programming experience. This is, this is good. And what have, you, what have you done with PLCs? And his response was, what's a what's PLC? A PLC right? And I was like, oh, man, <laughs> what did I get myself into? And I'm like, oh, OK, well, maybe he misunderstood the question. You know? <laughs> so I said, yeah, you know, it's a device. You program it. Traditionally, you do it with like ladder diagram. You've ever programmed in ladder? <laughs> like, no idea what ladder is. Is that something ladder. you climb to change a light bulb or whatever else? I'm like, oh, boy. So I was like, all right, well. What experience do you have? And he was telling me all about the uh, the experience he has in like Python and, and Java and C. And I was like, okay, great. And then I was like, oh yeah, you know, this is perfect for PLC next. We can we can get you into that and see what's going on, and you know, we'll, we'll see what we can do. But I, I think it's important anytime you bring anybody into an organization as an intern that you give them the full scope of the project they're working on. So I said, hey, get in here. What I'd really like you to do is look at some of this ladder diagram stuff that I was talking about on this PLC, by the way, this is the PLC thing that I was talking about. And uh, he, he created the simple program, but it took him a while. Like it, it was a couple of weeks to create a simple program using ladder, right? 
And then I said, hey, by the way, this PLC Next technology, it supports all these other programming languages. So now that you've done this simple turn off and on a light and do the simple operation, why don't you see what else you can do with it? And it was amazing. Within a, like a week or less, he had downloaded open source code. He had integrated on it. I don't know if you've ever seen the, like the photo hunt game where like the pictures you match, you look for differences between two different pictures that are side by side. He had that completely integrated into the this controller involved itself. Cats. This <laughs> involved cats. <laughs> it was cats. It was definitely cats. But the idea was, you could do an open source project in here that connected over to the IEC 61131 environment. So you could do standard yeah. operations while integrating open source code. Okay, so we're not dealing with cats in a traditional <laughs> industrial <laughs> control system. I get it. But the idea was it was an open source repository. Hey, we haven't told you about our vision system requirements yet. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, open source code put onto Linux running seamlessly with standard PLC control that you could interop between the two. It was a good technology project of our own to kind of show how you can use high-level language, how you can use completely open, and you can use this standard 61131 environment. And the big thing was the amount of vision and, and, and speed that we got mm -hmm. out of the open side of it was exponential compared to what you could do on that standard side. It's, it's not saying that anything's wrong with the PLC side. It's perfect, it's great. It does what it does really well. That's your well. foundation, but you don't want to be limited by that. And, and by the way, on the, stand, on the regular side, the, the older side, it was our control software that he had to learn, the old closed software. It was our environment, it wasn't anybody else's, but he had to do all that and learn all that. And then as soon as we moved into the open side, he was excited, happy, moving faster, everything was great. I mean, we watched it in one small intern this summer. You removed the constraints and you gave him freedom. Yeah. And that is sort of our vision. It's the new employees. They have the skills and the capability. And, and there are good uses for the structured, traditional, what works. Absolutely. But if we're going to solve real business problems, we're going to be, need to be innovative, which means you know, short of reliability, security, and safety, all the other facets should be freedom to operate. Right. Make it work. We're going to test it. But, you know, used responsibly, but again, right. with, an, right. with an open-minded approach to exerting that responsibility for, you know, security determinism, et cetera. I mean, we get it, but, but, but that's, the, that's the transition we have to go through. You know, you can't, you can't, the system can't prevent you from doing things, which is kind of the world that we're in today, but, you know, if we can just, you know, with responsible oversight and systems integration and good engineering practices, you know, not be shackled by our system. Yeah. We had very similar experiences, the internship yeah. experience Cats. as well. Cats was Cats. <laughs> it, it was a very, it was a, it was an engineer with many years experience sitting across the table debating this with a, somebody who just yeah. came from the college yeah. and could do all these amazing things except for with the the legacy tool set that we would, would place yeah. in front of them. Right. And you know, one, one person valued that because it gave them consistency and what they understood, and the other one was like, why am I constrained? Yeah. Why, why not? Why? Right. And that's really, I think, the, one of the questions we ask ourselves in those early days of the Skunk Works is, well, why oh. not? Right. Mm -hmm. yep. They got it. Right. Why don't we have it? And, and, it, and it transcends even the technology world. You know. Why is it guys who put in pumps get to change their pumps all the time? Mm -hmm. They're not running the same pumps they ran 40 years ago. They've upgraded them. They made them better. And they didn't have to change all the pumps to change that pump. And how come we can't do some of this? And, uh, you know, it becomes that let's take away the shackles. Let's take away the constraints. Let's do it responsibly. We do have to, you know, be cognizant of these manufacturing processes can get, you know, if you don't take care of things, it goes downhill quickly, you're shut down, you're losing money, you have all kinds of whatever other business issues you can have. And it's, uh, but why can't we just allow people to do what they're capable of doing? If you can think it up, why can't I build it? Right. Well, you know, I'd, I'd like to drive a little bit beyond that as, as, we're, as, as we're closing here. I want to talk about, you mentioned people, and you both mentioned kind of leveraging people. Beyond your own organization, can you tell us about 
you know, it, what's really been successful in, in the software world is a level of collaboration that people have been able to uh, develop and, and sustain over these technologies for a number of years. And it's really helped people to, to really drive that world forward with a lot of speed. What about PLC Next and, and what are you doing and what are you planning to do to develop that enhanced kind of collaboration among your customer base and, and others who are just interested in the technology? Because it goes beyond obviously the, both, both the suppliers and the traditional end users. So it, it's, it's a really good point, Harry. So, you know, one of the key aspects of PLC Next is we've talked a lot about the controller. We've talked about the technology, but PLC Next as a whole is really an ecosystem. And a, a very important part of that ecosystem is the community aspect. So with PLC Next, there is actually a community forum. And that is specifically there for users to converse with one another, to evolve the product, to evolve the technology, to actually support one another. And we have engineers and as well as product management and marketing all on this forum as well, not to censor or anything like that. It's, it's really to learn and collaborate collectively, which is very different than the way a lot of traditional systems have gone. But it is absolutely critical when we're talking about an open system because the whole idea of open is the thing that makes us uncomfortable. Well, we're going to run into a pitfall at some point in time. And then it's a matter of, well, how do you react to that? How do you overcome that? How do you move that forward? And you work together to make that happen. So there is the PLC Next community as well as a GitHub rep repository for open source code. So there are these different aspects to sponsor the collaboration to sponsor the interaction between users, engineers, and so on, on the product itself, to make sure that we're moving this forward and keeping it as open and, and universal as possible. And then the other key aspect is, so we've always tried to look at two sides of the coin, because we know that one of the really important factors of this is this ex immense openness that we've been talking about largely here today, but there is the, the, the open with maybe some confines to, to make sure that it works in more of a confined way. The other aspect we have is the, the PLC Next Store. And the PLC Next Store is, is an application library repository that really anybody can post towards. Because if you create a whatever runtime or this particular application or this particular functionality, you can make that available in the store and then as a user in a various industry, you can download that and you can put it on this controller and make it a purpose-built product for what you're trying to do. And we see this evolving over time in different industries with different people collaborating towards it. So collaboration and that openness, the people aspect again, is an important part of this overall ecosystem. And that seems to overlap I think to some degree with, with things that you guys have talked about in the, in the process automation world in terms right. of developing for yeah. this. So maybe you Absolutely. could tie that two, together. Two comments. So in, what, what is envisioned and being planned for in the Open Process Automation Forum it is a repository or a registry of you know, conformance certified hardware and software products highly analogous to the, to the, the uh, PLC Next store. The second thing to your, to your broader question though, Harry, um, about the benefits of collaboration, one thing that we are learning from working closely with the big tech companies who are members of the OPA forum is the way that the big tech companies approach, approach collaboration. It is amazing and they, they do not see the world as a zero sum game. And I'm watching the big tech companies, they, what they're seeing is that you know, for a unit X cost of collaboration, they are getting multiple X benefits in earnings as a result of that small investment in collaboration. It is really astonishing to, to see for-profit enterprises operate as if it's not a zero sum game. Mm -hmm. That is a, a really amazing to watch in practice. The other thing I'd jump in on collaboration, it's interesting, you know, again, being a company who's lived through these world 
this, this world of industrial automation and trying to participate it in a collaborative way. The way we used to collaborate was a major manufacturer would have a bus network or a something that they wanted a group and they'd start a little foundation in a group and put it together. But we all knew it was off of somebody's proprietary de developed Proprietary. system yeah. that yes, we hand over to the associate, but it was always a, a closed system, competing with some other closed system, competing with some other closed system. And everybody would have their club and put it together. So that's how we collaborated. But it always was slow yeah. and it, it always never worked in the big way, like the really big way. And the key was, we didn't know then, but we know now, the key was it was an open collaboration, truly open. And the foundation of what the openness was, was open. And that's why we chose Linux to be our open standard, if you will. And then what you see in our consumer world and other worlds, the reason it accelerates, just as Don has said, is because it's truly open. And the, the innovator that started it sort of gives it away, I mean, the concept away. And so then what happens is collaboration then equals acceleration. Yeah. You know, all of a sudden you get an accelerated environment. In our old closed systems ways when we were trying to collaborate, it was, it was a defensive mechanism. It was slow, very slow. But now because we're embracing open concepts, the collaboration can e equal acceleration and then innovation and then a real payoff for all right. that get involved. Cool. So that's all who willingly participate. That's right? they, they got to willingly participate, yeah. and you got to go. And it's it's really exciting, and that's why we're excited about the collaborative environment. We have a role. We have to create a store. We have to create a forum. We have to create the tools necessary to collaborate, and we truly need to be open. If we're not, when we collaborate on our device or we offer our device to be part of that collaboration community, if we're not truly open, it won't work. So that's the, the community yeah, interaction. The, the community won't embrace it and right. it won't happen. So that's the challenge that we all face in these open worlds, especially as suppliers and manufacturers that support a vision like ExxonMobil is, is uh, telling us about, that we really have to participate in, in a truly collaborative and open way. And that's a new thing for a lot of companies. It is. And so, you know, maybe just to, to wrap up, I'd, I'd like the ExxonMobil folks to kind of look forward with us maybe 12 to 24 months and what is going to be going on because there's overlap between the PLC Next technology and the technologies and companies that you're working with. So what what's on the horizon in the next year or right. two for open process automation? Okay, so I'll start with the, the ExxonMobil activities first, okay, to be crystal clear and then, and then we can talk about the OPA forum. So. So Dave, Dave has already sketched out what we're doing with what we call the prototype system, right. which is uh, um, it, it's, we completed factory acceptance test on a system that was uh, integrated by Lockheed Martin and Wood. We completed that factory acceptance test two weeks ago. That system is now being shipped to our pilot plant facility in Clinton, New Jersey, where we will run it for four-ish months, you know, expect to commission it by, 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 by December. Um, next step is we, we want to expand the, the population of uh, OPA systems integrators. So we have retained Yokogawa's services to be our test bed operator. So the test bed is, uh, as, as the word says, it's a facility in which we will test early you know, prototypical products and we'll test the OPA standard. Um, when Dave mentioned collaboration partners, he was talking about six other operating companies that have joined us to use that, that test bed facility. For ExxonMobil, the test bed is our means to begin the engineering work for our first field trial, where we're going to go into honest to goodness manufacturing. Okay, so in 2020, we will begin the site selection and the engineering work for that field trial. And that engineering work will continue into 2021. Mm -hmm. and exactly when we would commission that field trial system, maybe it'll be 2021. Okay, so that's, the, that's probably like three steps down the road okay. um, for ExxonMobil. In addition, um, 
We've, we've started a very active collaboration with uh, ExxonMobil upstream organization on how does OPA fit into what the upstream needs, which is largely greenfield project focused. Mm -hmm. And so we're now starting to look at where the entry points for OPA are in an upstream context. And we have a very active collaboration work going on internally between ExxonMobil Research and Engineering and ExxonMobil Upstream Integrated Services. So that's, we're trying. That's, that's we're, uncommon in the we're, industry. We, we are bringing we are bringing these we are bringing these uh, idea threads together and converging them again in the general interest. Um, what about outside of ExxonMobil? Okay, out, well, outside of ExxonMobil, um, so that's the forum. Uh, so we actually the, the door is still open for collaboration partners. So uh, you know, we're, we're not in the business of making commitments for anybody who haven't made them yet, and we're not in the business of counting chickens before they're hatched, <laughs> so we won't disclose who else we've been talking to, other operating companies to bring into the collaboration partnership. Um, uh, but, but growing, I, I think we're kind of at an inflection point, Harry, between the, you know, if you think, if you, uh, you know, uh, the bri bridging the chasm, if I can cite that book, we, we probably have the, uh, innovator early adopter group assembled, and now we need to get we need to get to that next tranche of adopters. I think what's going to make that transition point is when the suppliers start coming out with uh, announcing on their roadmaps OPAS conformant products. I mean, I think that's going to be the catalyst for making that transition, and, and again, building that population of systems integrators. I could go on, but I I, I don't want to make it too complicated. I, I mean, succinctly though. Um, the, the OPAS standard version two, uh, we expect to publish the preliminary version, the one that's for open industry comment. We expect to publish that in January of 2020. We begin the work on OPAS version three. We're on a 12 month cadence. We expect to publish OPAS version three in early 2021. We are also very actively now building up the conformance verification and conformance certification um, uh, entities and process. So w what I see here is, is you know, s some interesting possibility for overlap and uh, between kind of the customer base that you have in, in Phoenix Contact and, and the people who are working there along with the kind of work that you and your uh, Open Process Automation Forum partners, especially the end user companies, yeah. have to, uh, to drive together in the next couple of years. I think it's going to be very interesting. And I'd jump in with, you know, we have a lot of next steps too. And it's probably very obvious, but I'm going to say it anyway. One of our first next steps is we are going to support these two gentlemen in ExxonMobil and everything they do because they are championing a, a movement in industry that need, needs to be done. And so they of course will have lots of other suppliers competitive to us cooperating with us and we have to earn every step of the way but the mission that they're on is the mission we want to be on and so number one thing we will do is we'll support ExxonMobil and their efforts and then number two we've made a lot of promises to our world meaning all of our customers that we're going to bring to life our little open automation controller in our ecosystem and we have a lot of work to do yet there. We have to do a lot of product variants. We, we have to do build out this um, ecosystem that we talk about of getting collaboration partners in the game and working with us and posting applications to our forums. And so we have a lot of missionary work that we have to do to promote the same concept, but in a smaller way. So the journey is just starting. I, the way I look at it is, you know, our launch of our little product is just, it's great but we're just beginning. We have a lot of work to do to make sure we bring a lot of people into this, this, uh, this vision that can create a lot of excitement, I think, in the industrial world. And maybe I read any things I missed on what we're gonna do with the next. I, I think, I think you, you summarized it uh, perfect. And I mean, it's every, every journey starts with a step, and this is, of course, a, f a first step. And we've been working you know, along the way, but we've now brought this to life, and I think it does, comply a lot with the open process automation initiative and it does really help set the the other industries up as a as a as a platform for them to utilize in their applications as in a similar way 
and as an open platform. And, and one of the biggest things that we need to overcome is, or not overcome, but, but take on, is this community aspect. It's continuing to build this. Yes, we need to come out with more variations of products. Yes, we need to come out with more variations of I.O. It all connects together. And, and that will happen from a hardware perspective. But getting the adoption, getting the embrace, getting, getting the, the community to really take this on is, uh, is, is really the key next step. And uh, communications and cooperations like we have here today, I think is a, is a key, key way to And both of these things, is, I find interesting, both these things are kind of measurable. If you've got a community there, you can measure, and, and people do that with these various projects. Mm -hmm. They'll look at that community and measure it and see who's contributing and who's using, and, and that kind of gives you a solid metric for that, which you you've kind of have an open process automation in terms of engaging end user companies and, and developing uh, supplier participation as well. I think I thought I'd jump in one more thought. Um, you know, we, we, if you're a customer today, now ExxonMobil has a clear vision, they know what they're promoting, they're, they're on a strong path, but many other customers in many other industries don't have an ExxonMobil trying to clear up the cloud. And I often look at those companies and, and I look at all the messages we suppliers are throwing out to the market right now on Industry 4.0 or IIoT. It, it looks like we all claim we can do anything, anywhere, you know, anyhow. It's amazing. And you, you listen to the hype. There's tons of hype on this IIoT type world. But then the reality of being able to do those things varies. And, and it varies based on true products and hardware that can do the things we're claiming. And then if I was a customer, I'm listening to so many different suppliers. I don't know who to listen to and who to talk to. And if I was to truly and objectively evaluate everybody's claims, it would be a long journey. And so I've, I've likened it to, there's, a, there's sort of an automation paralysis going on right now. The, the, the poor customers are getting bombarded with all this information, this new technological world, but they don't know where to start and they don't know how to, take any next step. And that's the weird moment we're in. The promise is so huge, but the position we're in as suppliers and customers is a very apprehensive position to move. So for ExxonMobil, I think in the process world, you all are doing a great thing for that industry or that set of industries by championing an effort to clear up that fog. Believe me, in the rest of the industrial world, we're not all there yet. There, there's a lot of missions to be, to be conquered to clear up that, that story. So we as suppliers, with a lot of our peer suppliers, need to get together and help clear it up. There's going to be a lot of conversations to be had over the next decade to make sure it comes to life. But I really think then we will see that exponential curve of, of openness just kick in as we probably exit the next decade. It'll all be in reality. It'll all be moving. Well, I think we should move forward and, and, and really maybe get together again in, in, uh, in a year or so and just see where this has gone because, because uh, we kind of have roadmaps in front of us for, for a year and, and uh, it's been really enjoyable uh, chatting with you guys and uh, uh, maybe we should do it again soon yeah, it'll be perfect. just it'll be to see how it, it goes. Fun. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks. This is Harry Forbes from ARC Advisory Group. I've been with representatives of ExxonMobil and Phoenix Contact to discuss open process automation and the new Phoenix Contact PLC Next controller. Thank you very much and look forward to doing this again sometime.